take your Bibles and open up with me to the book of Nahum this morning. We're going to look at the book of Nahum. And I'm going to tell you, as I've been kind of studying the prophets for the last month and a half or so, I, I'm starting to see, understand things that actually have tremendous application into the world in which we live that I guess I just hadn't noticed this morning. And you're probably tired of me saying, you're never going to believe what I found. Like, this is the most amazing thing. But that's kind of how it is. Each time I open up uh, one of the prophets, I discover something that I hadn't seen before. Now, we've tried to be looking at a, a word or two that captures that particular prophet. And this morning, we're going to do that with the little book of Nahum, um, with a word in a second. But just for a moment, how many of you have at least at some stage in your life thought the question or asked the question, why does God allow bad things to happen in this world? Okay, great. Honest people all over the place. Um, Have you ever had the thought that why doesn't God do something about this now? Can I see your hands? Okay. Yeah. Like I think that's one of the major stumbling blocks for many people who don't come to faith in Christ. Like the agnostic says, I don't know because I don't see God working. And the atheist says, I I just don't believe that there is a God or else he would do something about the evil that's in the world now. And one of the coolest little passages that answers that question for all of us and gives us a touchstone to come back to in the scriptures is found in the book of Nahum. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Nahum speaks of patient judgment. Now, those two words don't seem to go hand in hand, do they? Patient and judgment. But remember, the cool thing about the prophets is that over and over again, they kind of keep putting ideas together that we don't think of going together. They put together God's anger and his wrath and his steadfast love. They put together God's judgment and his patience. And that's what we find in the book of Habakkuk. Now, watch this. Habakkuk Habakkuk chapter 1. I'll pick up the reading here at verse 2. Notice the attributes that are listed of God here. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So let me give you three ways to look at God as a judge this morning, okay? Um, And by by the way, uh, Paul didn't set that up with me, but his rendition of C.S. Lewis was like the perfect introduction to this. Because what you see in verse 2 is a God who doesn't appear to be safe. But what you're going to find in a little bit, down in Habakkuk a little later, is that this is a God who is, cl- who, who is declared to be good. So we get these two things confused. We look to God simply so that we could be saved, and we forget that he is a God who is a jealous God, an avenging God, even a wrathful God. He is great in his power. So he's a patient judge, he's a comprehensive judge, and finally, God is a good judge, tying into what C.S. Lewis said. God is a patient judge. Now, here's the kicker to this. His patience at times has been misunderstood as in action, okay? In action. That is, we look and say, why doesn't God do something about this today, okay? There, there's wrong things that are happening today. There's wrong things, you might say, that have happened to me. Why doesn't God act and here's the thing, God will act, but he's also patience, patient in that action. Now, let me just unpack um, something that, maybe four elements that consist of the patience of God, okay? And you may have never thought it about this way, but I kind, of want us, I kind of want us to take a look at elements that describe God as a patient judge, and that's important because if not, we tend to forget that there's elements in these four elements that can't be contradicted. So just say them with me. The patience of God consists of four things, a relationship, authority, and offense in time, okay? Say these with me. A relationship, authority, and offense in time, okay? By the way, you can almost, God's patience is different than ours, obviously, because it's steadfast and long-lasting. Ours tends to wear out a little quicker than that, but you can almost see that whatever you're struggling with in, in, with your own patience, these four elements have a factor. Right? Mom and dad, do you feel like your kids rebel? It's, it's hard to be offensive, not offended, because you have a role of authority. 
Kids, do you feel like, uh, like school is hard and difficult and you don't like the way somebody treated someone? Well, well, here it is. That ties to the idea of relationship. Patience is the factor of time, and we'll unpack that in a second. Let's talk about relationship. The patience of God consists of a relationship, investment with expectations. Any relationship you've ever given yourself to, any relationship, there probably was some degree of expectation. That's why you were a little offended when you gave to someone someone and they didn't say, gave something to someone and they didn't say, express gratitude. Or later they didn't give something in return. Even when we don't give, expect to get anything in return, we still expect that if we've done well, somebody somewhere, like God, will honor and reward us, right? God's relationship with the people of Nineveh, to whom which Nahum is writing, was an investment with expectations. Now, uh, this is pretty cool. You're going to be able to remember who Nahum was writing to because Nahum starts with the letter what? N. And Nineveh, the city he's writing with, starts with the letter N. You say, wait a minute, what's Nineveh getting a prophecy for? Like, I thought the prophecies were for Judah and Israel. That's true, but this is a unique prophecy geared specifically towards the city of Nineveh. Now, that's a city you've seen before. You may remember that there's Jonah. He's getting ready to prophesy, but he's down here in Israel, and Nineveh is clear up there as the capital of Assyria. In fact, it's located on the Tigris River, and, and um, that's been excavated, and they, they discovered things there. And, and, and all of this to say that um, Jonah took a message to Nineveh, okay? And you may remember we talked about that a few weeks ago from Jonah's perspective, but just for a moment, think about it from Nineveh's perspective. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, we read, when God saw what they did, that is, Jonah had said, repent, and the people repented, how they turned from their evil way, that's the idea of repentance. You were going one way, now you're turning the other way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God looked at the, nation, at the, at the Assyrians, those who were in the city of, of Nineveh, and he said, listen, I'm going to destroy you because of your actions. And their actions were bad, okay? Make no mistake about it. Like when they would take a country over in war and they would pillage that country and take from that country, they would do devastating things to the people that are there. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, when Jonah got his nose out of joint because God had said, I'm not going to destroy them, God said to Jonah, listen, should I not pity, pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? That describes children, like three and younger. So um, here's your picture. Your picture is that God said, listen, there's probably about a half a million people there when you count the younger children and the teenagers and the adults. God's saying, listen, should I not show them pity? So God had already, in this relationship with the city of Nineveh, given them a warning, and they had responded in a means of repentance. That's a relationship, an investment with expectations. Jonah was preaching here, um, though, in the 8th century, and now we're a few centuries later, 8th century B.C. Now we're a few centuries later, and here's what's happening. Um, 150 years later, the Ninevites have drifted from the true and living God again, and they are pursuing their old ways. It is a relationship with expectations. Briefly, let's talk about authority. God is right to be righteously angry. This is a way we don't often think of God because we tend to, tend to uh, f- lift up one aspect of his character and not another. But you can't miss this in the text. You, in fact, you can't miss this in the prophets. When you read the prophets, you see a God who speaks of himself with the character of jealousy, avenging, wrathful, and anger. By the way, we don't like to think of God that way because we prefer safety over goodness. But God is an authority, so he has a right to be righteously angry. In fact, look at the angry words in the text. Jealous, avenging, wrathful. Now notice it goes on to say that he is slow to anger, but you can't deny the fact that he has these aspects in his character. And that's important because remember, Nahum is about patient, long to be, slow to be anger, judgment, patient judgment. 
The great error that many in our world have today is that if God has been tolerant of what I've been doing now, then God must be approving of what I'm doing now. Hold on, hold on. Don't determine God's patience as his authorization. In fact, let me just give you a couple of words that are in the text here. The first word is jealous. Now, when you think of that word, you might think of like a, a junior high uh, passing notes in junior high. The girl passes the note to the boy. The boy passes it back. They're jealous because somebody else likes somebody else, okay? I just want to tell you, that's not this jealousy. In fact, um, this isn't a junior high kind of jealousy. In fact, um, one writer has said, the Bible does not use the word jealous like our culture does, at least when it refers to God. Instead, jealousy captures God's ardent commitment to bring glory to himself as well as his command that we, his followers, not compromise our exclusive consecration to him. In the scripture, divine jealousy reflects God's love, but it is an intolerant love. Now, that word doesn't sound right in our world, does it? Love should be tolerant, but God's love is intolerant. It is a love that will not permit his glory to be muddied by his people's idolatry. So when the Ninevites or when the Israelites or whoever had paused to worship the true and living God suddenly started worshiping their desires, their wants, their passions, God is right to be jealous because they were made in his image. Therefore, their idolatry is mudding his glory. You say, wow, that sounds like an arrogant God. It only sounds like arrogance because we interpret God the way we would think of him not as the God who is described in the Bible in his perfection. By the way, the jealousy of God is not only for his glory, but it's also for our good. You know that, right? Um, it's right for a parent to be jealous for a child if we want what is best for the child. Notice, not jealous of the child, jealous for. For a moment, just think about this. God, who is eternal, Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, he is from everlasting to everlasting, can actually look through the corridors of time and see what is best for you. You can't do that. You're guessing at what the future holds. You make decisions saying, this feels what is best for me. You make a decision, but guess what? God is the one who can look all the way out to you're an old person and say, that is not what's best for you. So I am jealous for you, not of you. God is right to think that way. And by the way, we're right to think uh, if God said that wasn't right for me, then that must not be right for me. In fact, jealous is one of the words there. Notice the word also includes the word avenging. Avenging. Um, that's a great reminder for us again. It's used to make the, the idea of avenge is used to make right a crime or an action that has taken place. When you read it in the Bible, you did this and therefore this happens as an act of avenging. It means that everything we do that's wrong has to be paid for in some way. Finally, we notice the word wrathful and the word wrath actually has the idea of keeping guard. In a human way, it looks like a grudge, right? I'm gonna hold on to that. In a God way, it looks like, listen, I've kept track of those things because as the perfect judge, those things need to be made right. God is jealous, he's avenging, he's wrathful. But I notice as well that he's slow to anger, which gives again that idea that God in his patience still will bring judgment. Here's the third idea. There has to be an offense. The patience of God consists of a relationship, authority, and offense. And I've noted that in the repents, this is offense, this is repeated wrongdoing. Like, God is a gracious God and a patient God, but we tend to continue to commit the same offense. Quick question. How many of you at some stage in your life have said, um, wow, I really made a big mistake there. I'll never do that again. Can I see your hands? Okay. So when I ask this next question, I don't expect to see any hands up, Okay. How many of you actually kept that commitment and because you felt so bad about that, you said you'd never do it again, you never did it again. How many of you would say, no, Phil, I did it again? Can I see your hands? Okay. Well, yesterday, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks for the honesty down front here. The point is this, that God in his graciousness grants us 
through Christ, right? Not in our own doing. But God in his graciousness looks at the offense and often gives a second chance. And we interpret that second chance as the authority to do it again and again and again and again. And I just want to remind you, God is patient, but he is ultimately the perfect judge. An offense is repeated wrongdoing. Just look with me at Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Remember, this is Nineveh. He's speaking to this city that had just executed masses of people, literally. You may remember me saying when we were talking through the book of Jonah, uh, the king of Nineveh would take the king, he would behead the king of the country he just took, he would bring that king's head back, put it on a stake outside of the city so that everybody who ever came to the city of Nineveh would say, you don't mess with this king, okay? He would execute people freely without reservation. And God says of that Nineveh city, chapter three, verse one, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. The crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, host of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies, that's what it's been like. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and people with her charms. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. God says, listen, you will be judged. You will be judged. Because of, he says to the city, because of your repeated wrongdoing. Okay, now that's judgment coming because of a relationship, because God is in authority, and because of an offense. But here's the thing. This is where we get messed up. We get messed up because of time. The judgment doesn't take place immediately. And that is because God is a patient God, not because he is a God who forgot, not because he is a God who who got busy on the other side of the planet, not because he is a God who's somewhere else in the universe. The judgment doesn't take place immediately because God is a patient God. In fact, note that with me in verse three. The Lord is slow to anger. That describes the, the idea that God is patient. He is slow to anger. By the way, this phrase, God is slow to anger, this is great. In numerous times, when you see this phrase show up in the Bible, slow to anger, I think it shows up about 17 times. In numerous times, it shows up in partnership with this phrase, for God is a God of steadfast love, or his love endures forever. It doesn't say that God will not bring judgment because his love endures forever. It says that he is slow to anger because his love endures forever. Both come hand in hand. You cannot separate one from the other. In fact, when we do that, we're not really looking at the Bible. We're trying to define God by how we feel about him as opposed to what the scriptures say about him. The Lord is slow to anger. He is patient. By the way, that's just not an Old Testament concept. That's a New Testament concept. Look with me again at 2 Peter chapter 3. For there, because Peter had been telling everybody that the Lord was going to return, people ask him, oh yeah, if he's going to return, where is he? Okay. See, God said he'd return, but he's not working on my timetable, so now I'm going to ask God, where are you, God? But of the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But, Peter says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Three verses. One talks about the patience of God. Don't get those two things confused. In fact, uh, I was reading yesterday, we were up at my granddaughters, you know, that's how I talk now about my daughter-in-law and my son, my daughter and my son-in-law, okay, my granddaughters, okay. We were up at my granddaughters and I picked up, my daughter's uh, Life Essentials Bible, and I turn to the book of Nahum just to see what Gene Getz was saying about that, okay? And I love this sentence. Think about it. We must never take God's patience for granted, assuming he will not judge sinful humanity simply because it has not happened yet. Wow. We must never take God's patience for granted, assuming he will not judge sinful humanity simply because it has not happened yet. 
This is your answer. When someone says to you, I don't get it. Like if you believe in God, Phil, then why does he allow these bad things to happen? And the answer is, because he's patient. He's patient. And the second part of that answer is he is patient with you and with me too. Because we are people who said, I'll never do that again. And yet we did that again. And aren't we glad that God is patient? There you have it. Now, just by way of reminder, God is a patient judge. When God is a patient judge with us, we tend to think that he is just patient and not a judge. But God is also a just and what I'm going to call a comprehensive judge. When he chooses to act, there is no escape. Okay? When he chooses to act, there is no escape. So if you came to church this morning or if you're listening online and you, and you all of a sudden say, well, that's okay, I got time, I got time, I got time. I just want to tell you, you were playing like Russian roulette in a serious way. Because when God chooses to act on your behalf and without Christ, the opportunity for you to respond in repentance will one day end. Okay? By the way, there's two ways that can end. Maybe you never thought about it this way. God doesn't offer opportunities for repentance after this life is over. That's why he's staying his judgment in, in 2 Peter, waiting for all to come to repentance. That's his desire. Right? There is no record in the scripture that on the backside of death, you get a chance to repent. Okay? So there's one way that God's comprehensive judgment, his choosing to act, and there's going to be no escape, happens. But there's a second way that you may not have thought about. The Bible also talks about people who harden their heart. We, we sung about that this morning when Michael was leading us about, Lord, this broke this stone heart. My, my heart prior to Christ is stone. It, it's like a stone. That's how Ezekiel 36 describes it. He takes out of us a heart of stone and he puts into us a heart of flesh. Okay? God is a comprehensive judge, which means that one day God will not only judge then, but there comes a point where if I continue to pursue what I want to pursue, and I do it saying, I know what God wants me to do, but I'm not going to do what he wants me to do, at some stage our heart hardens to the point where the callous is so deep that it may not change. It's a great reminder that God is a comprehensive judge. I had an opportunity as I was thinking about this text, even just this morning, this illustration came back to mind. When we have received patience from God, we tend to believe that he will continue to be patient. That's presumptuous. I was, uh, when I was in seminary a long time ago in a galaxy far, far, far away, okay? Um, when I was in seminary, um, one of my professors became a, actually a, a good friend of mine. Um, and so I guess I thought I had some privileges with him because he was a good friend of mine. And, I, and uh, he was my Hebrew professor, and he was teaching us the language of Hebrew. And at that stage, he said, listen, I have these homework assignments that are regular. Every single Tuesday and Thursday, you've got to turn this homework assignment in. But because I want you, I, I know it's going to get busy for you in the course of this semester, because I, I want you to understand the idea of grace I'm going to give you two of these assignments. You cannot turn them in, and I'm just going to give you 100 for them. Okay? That sounded pretty good for me, and so I took advantage of that on my first Tuesday and Thursday. Right? Okay? I didn't turn those assignments in. Right? And I can remember this conversation. Like, I can remember where I was standing in the parking lot, assuming he was a good friend, and because he'd given me liberty on my first two assignments, all of a sudden something happened, and I must have forgotten that I had an assignment due. And so I saw him in the parking lot. I said, hey, hey uh, Dr. Duell, can I talk to you for a second? He said, sure, sure. Kind, gracious, gracious man, okay? He's standing in the parking lot. I said, you know, I didn't get that other, I didn't get my assignment turned in today. He said, oh, that's okay. Y you have two passes. I said, well, yeah, that's it, but I, I took advantage of those two passes. And he said, well, then you got an F. I said, well, you know, but you did give me grace on the other two. And I've never forgotten this. He looked right at me, okay? And he's a good friend. He's still a good friend, by the way. And, uh, but, but he looked right at me and he said, Phil, is it, are you asking for justice? Well, yeah, I guess it's fair that if he gave me two off, I should get the third off. He said, okay, then you got three Fs. Do you really want justice? Uh, no, I don't want justice, and I'm going to stop talking to you now, okay? 
Why? Because when we are given and granted grace and patience, we make an assumption that that's what we should deserve. Okay. No, we don't deserve that. God has been patient with you. That's a beautiful thing. Don't make the assumption that you have the right to his patience. It's exactly what the Ninevites did. They assumed he had been gracious 150 years ago, so he should be gracious for them now. And God is comprehensive in that judgment. In fact, notice this. You and I don't have control over the earth and the sea like this, but look at verse 4 through 6. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Here's what Nahum is saying. He is saying, listen, because he is patient, don't assume that he will not do this because he is also a comprehensive judge. In fact, this is pretty cool actually, how Nahum prophesies certain things that take place. In fact, I'm gonna show you this in the text and we're just gonna kind of move through these real quickly. Look with me at, at, uh, at Nehemiah, I'm sorry, Nahum chapter two, verse six. Chapter two, verse six. For there we read, the river gates are opened, the palace melts away, and then verse 8, Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Nineveh was on the Tigris River, and, and, and actually in the third year of the siege, that is the third year that the king of Nineveh, Sennacherib, was actually besieging Jerusalem, trying to attack Jerusalem, the city flooded. Histori- history records that the entire city flooded. Okay. What God had prophesied in his judgment took place. Here's the next one. Nineveh is destroyed by fire. In fact, verse 13 of of Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots with chariots and smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions, or your young soldiers, that's metaphorically speaking. How about verse 15 of chapter 3? There will be fire, there will the fire devour you, the sword will cut you off. You, You know that Nineveh was destroyed. But the old city wasn't actually excavated, you ready to this, until 1850. You say, 1850, that's forever ago. That's forever ago for you. But it's not forever ago when it was 2,300 years ago that it was prophesied that it would be destroyed. And when they dug up and excavated the city in 1850, you know what they found? Gates that were charred and burned. God had said what he was going to do, and that's exactly what he did, because God is a comprehensive judge. In fact, God said as well that he would destroy Nineveh's idols, chapter 1, verse 14. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave for you are vile, he says. He's going to destroy them. In fact, in a history records that Ishtar, the goddess that the Ninevites worshipped, was discovered headless in Nineveh's debris. Okay, like, that's pretty serious. Like, God said, okay, I'm going to show you when you find your God that I have actually destroyed your idols. We find that God prophesied through Nahum that Ninevites' officers would flee. Chapter 3, verse 17. That's not exactly who you want guarding your back when you're the king. Look at verse 17. Your princes are like grasshoppers, your scribes like clouds of locusts, settling on the fences in days of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. And yet, history records that Assyria's army deserted the king. You're told that Nineveh would be pillaged because they had pillaged others. That is why we read in Nineveh chapter, in Nahum chapter 2, Uh, Verse 9, plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all the precious things. And when the Babylonians came in and attacked the city of Nineveh, they carried off all the spoils of war. It's almost like they said, hey, thanks for collecting all that gold and silver for us. We're going to take it. Okay, And they did. Note this one. Nineveh's destruction would be final. In fact, chapter 1, verse 9, Nahum prophesies again. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end trouble will not rise up a second time. God will bring it to an end. In fact, there's a number of um, cities that were massive cities that, that were destroyed but later came up from the ruins. The city of Jerusalem being one of those. You can go to Jerusalem today. Guess what? You can't go to Nineveh today. 
Samaria was reconstructed as well, but not Nineveh. God said, listen, I will destroy Nineveh. And Nineveh was never rebuilt. In fact, I know it's like, uh, let's see, 2,000 and then another 800. I know it's like 2,500 years ago. That's hard to believe. But when they excavated Nineveh and found the foundations, the artist's rendering of the city looked like this. Okay. Now, 2,800 years ago, that's a city. Okay. Amazing. The Assyrian king had developed all these kinds of things that were just remarkable. They excavated the city up in modern-day Iraq, and it's never been rebuilt, but even its excavation, are you ready for this? In 2016, was further destroyed. You see, Phil, 2016, like that's just four years ago. That's right. When ISIS took over that area in Mosul, right outside in, in modern-day Iraq, they actually brought bulldozers in and knocked down what was there. In fact, if you go online, you can see a picture that looks somewhat like this. Here's the photographer showing you what the picture used to look like of the city that they'd found. And literally, there's pictures of bulldozers where ISIS is knocking down the city, destroying all of that history that was there. This is a remarkable reminder that God said, this city will not be rebuilt. And I'm reminding you, even in 2016, God says that that city will not be rebuilt. You say, well, Phil, that sounds really harsh. God is a comprehensive judge. Do not think that you will escape his judgment just because he's patient with you. This is precisely the teaching of Nahum. Listen, God is slow to anger, but someday that judgment is coming. One final one. Here it is. God is a good judge. He punishes the rebellious and he protects the repentant. God is a good judge. He punishes the rebellious and he protects the repentant. In fact, um, remember how we started with, uh, Paul started with that C.S. Lewis quote? Let me show you that in the scriptures. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. By the way, if you were reading, I don't know if C.S. Lewis was reading Nahum when he wrote that part into the character of Aslan the lion, but if you're reading, look with me at verse seven, the Lord is good. Now let your mind, I drift back up to the beginning, verse two of Nahum chapter one. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Wow, you'd say the Lord is not safe. Okay, you're right, but the Lord is good. And the link to the fact that God is an avenging God and the fact that God is good and how we understand the world today is verse three, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. God is good. In fact, I was reading uh, this week and I came upon um, um, uh, the, the systematic theology book where it actually kind of unpacked the goodness of God in a way that applied it to God's mercy, to his grace, and to his patience. So when we think of something as good, we tend to think, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Kim makes this really good Jewish apple cake, okay? But that's not how God looks at goodness, right? Th though her cake is still really good, right? God's goodness is attached to his character. In fact, in such a way that, watch this, God's mercy is his goodness towards those in distress. We're in need, God is merciful. His grace is his goodness towards those who deserve only punishment. I've sinned against God and he gives me grace instead, that is his goodness. His patience is his goodness toward those who continue to sin over a period of time. God's mercy, his grace, and his patience all express his goodness to those who are in need, to those who have sinned against him, and to those who keep doing that. By the way, here is the beautiful lesson of the scripture in case you're listening to this like for the first time. The believer understands that things like God's judgment, his wrath, and his jealousy for us fell on Jesus on the cross, not so it doesn't fall on us. We call that the, we call that the idea of 
fact that Christ was substituted for us. We deserve that, but instead, God placed that on his son who was perfect in his righteousness. You say, well, that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair, but it is right because our sin was paid for by Christ, who, by the way, didn't do it against his will, but did it willingly. Does it seem fair to you that when you pull through um, McDonald's and you come to pay your bill and the person in front of you and the, and the person there says, hey, listen, this person left me the card number and they said, um, listen, I want to cover his lunch. Right. Have you ever thought for a second, well, if I'd have known that, I'd have ordered a lot more, <laughs> okay, right? Okay, can I tell you something? I don't care what you did. I don't care what you've done. Christ has paid the penalty for your sin. That is his mercy. That is his grace. That is his patience. When we look at the world in which we live and all the confusion, all the, all the angst and everything that is happening, and you say, when is God going to do something? I just want to remind you, you now know the answer. He is waiting because he is patient. And when the people around you say, I don't believe in God because if he was going to do something, he'd do something and he hasn't done anything. I just want to tell you again, listen, God is patient. He is patient. In fact, we know, and close with this thought, just take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Romans real quickly. Let me show you something in the book of Romans. When you're talking to people, or maybe today, you're sitting here saying, well, Phil, that sounds like you're from your Bible, you're reading from your Bible, and, you know, is, is that stuff really true? Okay. I just want to remind you that you know that it's true based upon a couple of things. Look with me at Romans chapter 1. There's an external truth, and there's an internal truth. Romans chapter 1, uh, verse, uh, verse 18, for the wrath of God, see, there's that judgment idea, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, here's the external truth, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Okay, now watch this. Look at the pew in front of you. Just touch it. Can you do that for me? Okay. Do you think for a moment that that thing just happened? Right. That it just kind of happened? That the world blew up and, and the pew happened? You said, no, Phil, that's stupid. Of course, of course I understand that somebody made this. Even the creation itself is revealing that there was a creator. Think about the clothes you're wearing for just a second, whatever you're wearing today. If you, pulled the ta- if, you pulled, if, you, if you looked at the tag, it might say something like, made in what? China. That's probably what it says. Okay, made in China, okay? Have, let me just ask a question. How many of you have been to China? I don't, I don't even see a hand. What, one hand, okay? How do you even know that place exists? Because the creation, something that you're wearing, shows you that something was made somewhere. You don't think it just happened. Right. Now, just for a moment, look at your hand. Wiggle your fingers. How do you think that happened? This is not nearly as, this is way more complicated than what you're wearing in the pew in front of you. And what the Bible teaches is this, that God is showing himself real through all of creation that those who are seeing it should know that they are not without excuse, but that's not the only thing. Take a look with me here in Romans. Take a look with me at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Down about verse 15. For when it speaks of the law, it goes on to say, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when according to my gospel, here it comes, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. God, who is ultimately the judge, is saying, listen, your conscience, even though it's broken before you come to faith in Christ, is still kind of signaling some stuff that's going on. Just be honest with me for a second. How many of you, before you 
ever came to faith in Christ knew that certain things were right and certain things were wrong. See your hands. How'd you know that? Because there isn't only an external witness, creation, but there's an internal witness, something that says you probably shouldn't do that. You say, well, I know, that's the voice I ignore all the time. But let me tell you how I know it's there. If you ever are about to do something wrong, and you look to the left, and you look to the right, why are you looking? If you believe that you can do whatever you want, why even look? Because internally we know that God is saying to us, listen, there is a day in which you will have to pay for the decisions you're making. It's a great reminder to all of us. Here it is this morning in summary. God is a patient judge. His patience at times has been misunderstood as inaction. It's not, okay? God is a comprehensive judge. When he chooses to act, there is no escape. God is a good judge. He punishes the rebellious and he protects the repentant. The day is coming when God will judge. Nahum says very clearly, and that's demonstrated through how God judged a city 2,500 years ago. It's a great reminder for each of us.